Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture. This week we'll be looking at citations, which I've gotten a lot of questions about. But before we get there, I want us to really take a look at your survey results from last week. Um, I'm still working on getting caught up on your grades, so please bear with me, but just know that even when it comes to your grades, if you do the assignment following the instructions, you will get you will receive for full credit. The only assignments that I'm really, really grading you based upon um, your content and delivery is your final drafts of your essays. So if we look at the survey results, only 12 of you have completed this, which means eight of you have not. And I want to encourage each of you to please, 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 please get these survey results in because it really helps me and it helps make the, the learning experience great for you. One of the, the main reasons why I want you all to get this in is because if we look at question two, I want to make sure that everybody knows that next Wednesday or this coming Wednesday, sorry, you have an assignment due as well as an assignment due on Friday. So your peer review is due on this Wednesday by midnight and then your revisions, any revisions that you want to make, you don't have to make those revisions, but if you think those are good comments that you got back, like I want those, those are due um, on Friday at 11.59 p.m. All right. <clears throat> Most of you have already signed up for your virtual conferencing, which will be next week. Um, and if you haven't signed up, you already plan to do that. So the first question that you all were asked was, were there any instructions pertaining to the sustainability autobiography essay that you were confused about? Most of you said like, no, everything was clear. Although there were a few of you who did email me and ask about citations. Um, so that's what we're going to cover shortly, but I'm happy to know that most of you all thought that <laughs> every day was extremely specific um, as it relates to the instructions. I also asked were there any particular issues or frustrations you were having in this course. One person said that they felt like it was a large workload, but most people said that they didn't really have any major issues. There were some people who talked about just the intimidating aspect of writing an essay. So just starting an essay is a slow process, holding myself to a high standard as a writer is a little stressful for me. Trust me, I get it. So once they're trying to be eloquent enough, look, the reason why we have, the reason why I'm having you peer review your accountability partner's essay so that you can get feedback as well. And the reason why I'm meeting with you, I'm taking out all this time next week to meet with you um, to conference before you turn in your final assignment is because I know that when I was in college, we didn't have, a, I didn't have that one-on-one -on -one attention. I'm here to provide you that one-on-one -on -one attention and to make sure that, look, I know it's stressful, especially if you're trying to write in a way that you really want to connect with your audience, right? But the other thing I want you to know is that you have time. You got a couple weeks, you know, before this essay, this final draft is due. So don't, I just want to de-stress this off for you. Like when we meet next week, tell me whatever is bothering you and we'll, we'll work through that together. So I also asked you if you felt that if there were any assignments or if you felt that, the, that your assignments was practical and helped you, and most of you all, actually all of you all said that yes, everything was helpful. Um, I asked you all about the strengths voice thread lecture, and those of you who respond, all of you said those were that was helpful, and I'm good. I'm really glad to know that because um, again. If you're not in an FYE course, when you get to an FYE course, you will be using strengths. And so I'm really happy to introduce that to give you this strategy and this tool to use to like help you to understand a little bit more about yourself. I asked you all if there were any um, problems that came up in VoiceThread. A couple of you said it was very slow or it, it lagged and glitched. I have never experienced that. So what I want to suggest is that you all reach out to IT for those of you who felt that it was glitching and lagging um, to see what might have been the problem because I, I don't know. I've never experienced that. Um, it could be your computer. It could be the internet connection. It could be something else entirely. So please reach out to IT to figure out why 
voice thread was glitching and lagging for you. Ask which one you prefer, the voice thread or the screencast recordings, and you all said that you overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly you prefer voice thread. And that is absolutely fine. You will notice that I'm not using voice thread right now. <laughs> and that's because it just wasn't good for this um, assignment in this lecture that I wanted to do. But I'm glad to know that you all like voice thread in, in an interactive lecture. So I will try to keep that in mind as I'm designing lectures throughout the remainder of this course. As you all, where lectures are clear and informative and the overwhelming amount of you all said yes they were they were clear almost immensely and then some of you were like three of you said they were just most of the times so no one said that no they weren't clear or just some of the time so I feel so good about that thank you all and I'm glad that it's very clear for you all I asked about the writing descriptions underneath the assignments and how I deliver content and everyone said it's been helpful and someone said thank you for taking the time to write out descriptive instructions. You are very welcome and I am so happy to write out descriptive instructions and I wish you all knew how much time I put into writing out descriptions and how much time I, I put into like revising the descriptions just last week. I had things that were in caps and bolded because I write so much that I just want you to, sometimes I want to make sure you get the main things if you're quickly glancing through it. And I remember I went through last week and I was just like, let me take out the bolded and the all caps because I think they may think I'm yelling at them. Please know I am not yelling at you. I just want to make sure that certain things stand out. <laughs> and like when you're quickly, you know, like going through you know the list of things you have to do you see the descriptions and the most important things from the description so no I'm not yelling at you but yes the descriptions take a lot of time and I'm constantly revising the descriptions especially when I make the um, when I open up the content at 5 o'clock on Mondays and I get emails then I revise for clarity based upon the emails or the questions I ask so um, I, I think the person who said I get the most directions on how to do things in this class and I love it. I appreciate that so much. Um, I asked you to rate the amount of work you feel you have to complete each week in this course. None of you said that the workload is, is extensive but manageable or at least you just don't feel like you had too much work or too hard and then there were three of you who felt like the class is overwhelming you. For those three of you, I think during conferencing we should definitely talk. Please bring up any comments or any issues you're having because the you could be feeling overwhelmed because you know you you're new to college and this is your first year as a freshman. It could be that you are taking this class entirely online. The amount of work that's in this class is the same amount of work that's in a face-to-face -face class, but it could be that you're just not used to taking online courses and you prefer face-to-face. -face. And so next semester, you may want to make sure you only take face-to-face -face classes so that you don't feel overwhelmed. Or it could be just that you are, there, there's so many other external things and issues that may be happening, right? It could be maybe you're working a job, maybe this COVID and this pandemic is stressing you out, maybe roommate situation, so many other things that may impact you, your ability to, to really um, feel like, or it may impact your ability to, and you feel like a lot of things are um, easily overwhelming you. And then I ask you, is there anything you want to see added? Most of you are like, no, I think the structure now is perfect. Or I like this space. So I'm so happy to see that because um, you never know. Some students don't like, um, you know, online learning or the self-paced model. And I was really worried about this was the question I was most worried about. Did students um were students okay with completing assignments at their own pace? And most of you all were absolutely fine with that. So I'm so happy to hear that. And then question 14, I asked you, what did you appreciate the most? Many of you said the weekly modules. So many people said the checklist, the checklist, the checklist. I am gonna keep the checklist every week, I promise y'all. And I was so happy to see that someone said they love the Clifton Strengths test. <laughs> um, and then I also appreciate it in alignment with the person who said that they love the, the Clifton Strengths test, that they appreciate the focus on introspection and really 
to me, those two comments mean so much because um, one of the things that I'm trying to do in this class is really teach you how to live in harmony with the world and the environment and to live in a lifestyle and in, in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. And I want you to figure that out for yourself because no one else can figure that out for you. And so this is a reflexive class. It's one that asks you to think about who you are, how you learned certain things and values about, you know, the things that you care about, and then to write those out. So part of the Clifton Strength Test, I remember when I first was introduced to it, I was immediately, I, I loved it because I thought this was one way for students to really understand a little bit more about themselves. One of you said, you're my only professor that has used the course assignment, the course home announcements and news tab, which helps structure out the week easier. And I will continue to keep doing that. And I'm glad you said that because I was worried that I was like harassing you like an overbearing mom, like emailing you all all the time and posting all these announcements. But I just want you all to know that I'm accessible, number one, and that, you know, like I am really reading through your assignments and reading through your emails and figuring out things and smoothing things and covering things based upon the questions that you ask. And then finally I asked, is there anything else you would like me to know about how the course is going for you? And most of you all were like, I'm really enjoying it and I appreciate that. And then it was someone who's like, I am enjoying this course and I enjoy having you as a professor, even though I don't see you each week, smiley face. I don't know who said that, but I just want you to know that I appreciate that. And if I ever find out who that is, you will be my most favorite student in the whole entire world. <laughs> okay. All right. So now let's go to what this week is really about, which is citations and sources. So let's begin. The main way that we want to begin is thinking about what is a source. So I got like 10 emails after I posted last week's module, weekly module. And a lot of you have questions about like, I don't know how to say, I don't know what a source is. What do you mean by a source? Okay, so a source is any quote you use to make your point, to back up your point, or to back up what you say, or to add depth and nuance to your paper. And I want you to look at those three iterations really closely. So let me make this bigger so that you all can see. All right, so a source is anything that really helps you to prove something, that really makes what you say, like it, it, it hits home and it just drives home everything that you have to say. So it can add depth and nuance, it can back up what you say, or it can actually help you prove your point to say like, look what I said, I know that what I said is truthful because. So some of you are wondering about which sources you can use in your paper. One of the sources you can automatically use is just the definition of sustainability a sustainability sponsor that was offered by Deborah Brandt. You can go ahead and use that. That's one source you can go ahead and take away. Another one is any definition of sustainability that you connect with that you found online. Maybe you don't agree with the, the entire definition of a literacy sponsor or a sustainability sponsor that Deborah Brandt offers. Whatever, whichever one you feel like you connect with, use that, include that in your paper. So that's two sources you have already. And then a source um, is one that can even provide statistics or data about an event. So if we think back to the Hurricane Katrina example that you had to read last week, right? Maybe if this person had to include sources in their paper, that this Hurricane Katrina paper was from a completely different class but let's say they had to um, use a legitimate range of sources one of the ones they could use is just providing statistics or data about an event and in doing that they could talk about you could use a source that talked about the the extent or the damage that hurricane katrina caused or the number of people that were affected by 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 the hurricane or you know the aftermath of the hurricane Any, anything they can use to really say a little bit more about what happened as a result of hurricane katrina or what happened in hurricane katrina is an important point that they can 
use the source to make. Now, I know a lot of you all want to know what are good sources. So, the number one thing I want to point out to you is that they must be attain, obtained from a credible place. So, what does credibility look like? That can encompass a number of different things. One of the things that I want you to avoid for this class is I want you to avoid Wikipedia and I want you to avoid dictionary.com. Okay. So Wikipedia and dictionary.com, they're not bad sources, especially because they give you, they open you up to different things. So Wikipedia, they have links that you can, they have links embedded within the website that you can kind of like click on to actually go directly to the source. Um, and I would, encourage you if you do use Wikipedia maybe you can use that as a starting point to like get more information and then you know use that as a way to find more links but Wikipedia and dictionary.com especially dictionary it, it just gives you such a basic level of information um, for instance if we were to look up sustainability on dictionary.com the definition for it would be so basic and it doesn't really give you the depth that you're looking for um, and then it's just like a really overarching way of defining words and same with wikipedia it just gives you a very um it doesn't give you the kind of depth that you need and then we also know that people can't anybody can can edit Wikipedia. That's why it's called a wiki. <laughs> so you use those as your starting points, but use those only to like find more credible websites. So what are credible websites? We usually define them as scholarly sources. So those are the sites that end in .edu, .org, .gov. Um, sometimes there are articles written by people with professional degrees, such as MD, PhD or JD. So if you see that after someone's um, name or if you see those abbreviations, usually you know that you can trust them. They also include articles written on college websites. So if you see a college website, usually those include people who have fact checked most of what's being put up. So the one thing you want to avoid is fake news. Okay. <laughs> Nothing that looks um, illegitimate in any way. Um, another example of a scholarly source, and most of you all may not be familiar with it right now, but it's peer-reviewed journal publications that, that can be found through a library database. Um, College of Charleston has its own library database that you can look up journal publications on. Um, but we'll talk about that later in the semester. Um, but a really good example are credible newspapers with fa with fact checkers so the new york times the post and courier cnn bbc those are all good newspapers because they include really good fact checkers now sometimes you it won't be cut as, as cut and dry as just looking at a website and saying oh it's the new york times or it's cnn right so then in those moments you have to just use good judgment a thing spelled correctly or do you think they're just posting for shock value? Do they make most of their money because people are coming in and clicking on things for shock, shock content? Does the website look legit to you? And can you even research the author? Is there an author included that you can Google or look up to find and learn more about their credentials? So all this is important for thinking about what are good sources. Now, how to find sources. So a lot of students don't really like including sources because it means they have to read more and or because they think that they look smarter or they, they come off looking better if they say, oh, I wrote this all on my own. But really, sources help you to be more informed and they actually make you look more knowledgeable. Like I couldn't have written my dissertation for my PhD without sources. If I had said, this is everything that I know and you should believe me and trust me, actually no one would have believed me or trust me. So actually sources make you look really good. And one of the things I wanna to stress to you is that the more knowledge you take in, the easier it is to write about a topic. So if you begin looking up more about the topic and researching about the topic, then it becomes easier to actually write about it. So one of the things you can do is begin reading examples 
which is why I provided some samples for last week about your about how your sustainability autobiography could look like. And this is just so that you have an understanding of the possibilities for the um, assignment. But then you should also research, use Google, use any means that's available and affordable to you to begin researching um, more about sustainability and then brainstorm how you want to begin. Once you do research, then it's easier to begin to brainstorm it because you have so much, you have an abundance of ideas and, and information at your disposal now. So I want to encourage you all and reinforce the idea that not doing any research and not you know looking up sources or reading more about the topic actually does you more more of a disservice so some of the questions that i got about the sustainability autobiography essay i had someone email me and they were like i don't know what sustainability is so i don't know how to write this paper and this was before this person even listened to the lectures last week so because you just had this you know initial reaction to i don't know what that is I can't do this paper then I got an email and I want you all to know that you know one everything that everything that I ask you to do it will be covered in your lectures and also as part of a good work ethic you should not give up at the first instance of like I see something I don't know I have to email my professor and tell her I don't know or tell them I don't know like usually we're asking you to do, to do this assignment because we really believe that you have the means and the accessibilities and the abilities to complete it. So really, I'm not asking you to know what sustainability is because as I covered in the last lecture, there's no one overarching definition. Um, I just want you to identify and relate to the concept of sustainability. How do you feel like you connect with it? That's what this first initial assignment is, because later in the semester, we're going to be reading way more um, complex um, and dense articles. But it'll be easier if you can really have a standpoint for inter interpreting what sustainability can look like, because it doesn't look like one thing to everybody. Every program, every business model, every company, everyone has a different definition of sustainability. So again, this essay is just about how do you identify and relate to the concepts that I went over in the five, um, the five key layers of sustainability as well as the five aspects of personal sustainability. I also got a question for someone who's like, there's nothing I need to back up or provide a factual basis for, so I don't know why what source to use so the advice i would give is just to reread your paper to see what things you may want to further contextualize or provide more information about for your audience because and when i say contextualize i mean what other what other sources can highlight or prove or give background information that is not available in your paper so i think there's always 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 the the ability to do that in any paper you can always include sources so again reread your paper see where you might can further give more information all right and then the question the third question i got was does the essay have to be a complete narrative story or can it be a telling of a couple events that shaped our personal sustainability this is a great question and i just want to say it can certainly and definitely be a telling of a number of things that shape your beliefs about personal sustainability it doesn't have to be this one story that just um ties everything together and changes your life there could be a number of things because that's what life is so now that we know what citations or i'm sorry what sources are and what good sources are and how to look up sources or identify the sources now we have to know what are citations a source is really what makes up your citation so you can't have a citation without a source all right so what is a citation and i want you all to read this this definition very carefully a citation is a direct quote or a summarized concept that you read or heard that may or may not have an author listed now what I mean by that is that we all know how to direct quote things but sometimes students will like 
change one word in a sentence and then not attribute it to getting it from somewhere else. But if you are summarizing or if you are just changing one or two words in a sentence, like removing the or and from the sentence, you still have to cite that as a source. All right. So that's still one of your citations. So to answer your questions or question of what and when do I need to cite something, you need to cite something anytime you quote or summarize something that you learned from somewhere else that is included in your essay. Anytime you do that. So it does not matter if you know you just changed a couple words. That still needs to be cited. And again, to reinforce the concept. Citations actually make you look like a scholar. It makes you look like you are well read. So don't think that including a lot of citations makes you look like, oh, I don't know anything. All right, now that we know what citations are, I want you all to remember and know that in your papers, you are always supposed to cite in two ways. The first way, is via in-text citations. So what are in-text citations? Directly speaking, citations or in-text citations are those citations that come in the body of the paper. That means as soon as you put something in quotation marks or summarize something, you let the reader know that this was taken from somewhere else and you picked this up from somewhere else. So if you look at this example right here, um, it's talking about a direct or is using a direct citation that is immediately in quotation marks and then right outside we know that it's an ex it is an example of an in-text citation because it's using parentheses. So in the parentheses we see the author's last name and then we also see the page number. Now for you all you may not have and you may not always have an author's last name, and in that case, you may have to use the title of the book or the website. And then if you have the page number or if you're taking it from a book, then that's good. But sometimes you may not even have that either. So this is the example um, of an index citation. Now, the second way that you cite, and you should always cite in this course, is through a works cited or bibliography page. So actually your works cited page and your in-text citation, they speak to each other. So let's take a look at this example. So you see on your left hand side in yellow highlighting, you can see the, um, the in-text citations. And the in-text citations correspond to the works cited page. So even the ones that don't have a an author's last name or an author author's name, you see that it has the title of the um of the in-text citation that corresponds to the same thing on the works cited page. So works cited page and in-text citations go hand in hand. And so they must match and correspond. So let's go, let's get more deeply into your work cited and how that's supposed to look. For this class, we're using the MLA works cited format, which is in the eighth edition. Now, the eighth edition is a really important thing to, to denote that I want you all to make sure that you all understand. So this example that I've had that I have here is really not eighth edition, it's seventh edition. And the difference between 7th and 8th and or 6th and 5th editions is that people have been quoting cit citations and sources from, since the beginning of, of writing. What I want you all to know is that each year and sometimes every other year, these citation formats are updated. But they all have the same gist or the same central theme, which is... They have the author's name that begins at the beginning. They have the place, or I'm sorry, the title of the um, article or the title of the book. They have the place it was published. This one was in New York. And then it has the publisher, which is, this one is the Modern Language Association. And then it has the date of publication. And this one has print, but this is from the seventh edition. So it has print and like web after it to let you know that, oh, we found the source either 
you know, it was a print copy or it was online. But now that we're in the eighth edition, we don't really have to do that to write print and web because your URL will let you know if it's um, a web based source or an online source. So one thing I want you to know is that there are so many different editions and formats of MLA, but the one I want you to use is the eighth edition. Whenever you um, whenever you look for look up MLA format, and the eighth edition makes sure that you include or it asks you to include the URL. But even if you are using the eighth edition. Really, I'm not going to take off too much, of, you know, in regards to your citations. The main people who really need to worry about citations being perfect are those people who are publishing a book or maybe publishing for an academic audience or an audience that everyone in the world is, or you know, that is going to be accessible to, to people throughout the world. These, however, are the four main things that I want you to always cite in your bibliography or works cited page. Number one is the author. If there is one, not everything that you use will always have an author. Um, and then I also want you to remember that only the first author's last name comes first if there are multiple authors. So let's take a look at this. Go back and take a look at this example. So we see Russell Tony. His last name comes first because that's how you order um, work cited, but everybody else's name is just written out regularly. So the author's name, if there is one, the title of the art article and or the title of publication. So maybe there's not a title of the article, but maybe there's a, a name for the book or the journal or the website or the podcast, video or movie, song, etc. The date of publication and this can just be the year it does not necessarily have to be um, the whole like month day and year it can just be the year and then where you obtain the quote or data from because I know most of you all will probably use URL sources or web-based sources so just include the link to where you got the information from so that I can easily click on it and see it this is an example I decided to include the example of a student in my class last semester who wrote a paper and he had a works cited page that I thought looked really or was really well done and he referred to it as references I'm happy if you just you can call it references works cited bibliography I'm absolutely fine with any of those um, but one of the things that I want to, to point out is that each new source starts um, with a line that begins at the margins so um, the first line of the source starts at the margin and then the other lines are indented for 0.5 inches. And in order for you to indent, just hit the tab key on your keyboard and that will indent it 0.5 inch. You can include a URL um, or you should always include a URL, but you can include it on the same line or on a different line. Again, I'm not going to take off for that as long as you have the, the required information there, you're good. So don't stress out about it, okay? Um, you don't have to put the entire date here. He put the 22nd of March, 2017. If you just wanted to put 2017, that's absolutely fine. And again, because um, this, we're now in the eighth edition, you don't have to put print or web after sources. So that's an outdated model. So don't you don't really have to follow those models that you find online about how to write um, a works cited in MLA format that says you have to put print or web afterwards. So I just want to leave you with these works cited tips. Number one, begin your works cited page on a separate page. If we were in a um, if we were in a regular class, a face-to-face -face class, and I had asked you to print out your essay and bring it in, I probably wouldn't have mentioned this, but because we're not turning any in anything physically, I am going to ask you to put your works cited page on a separate page because you're not wasting any paper, but also because I think sometimes students think that their works cited page can count as part of the minimum page requirements and it can. So put it, your works cited page on a separate page. Um, and number one, it'll help you to understand how much you've actually written. And then it'll help me to distinguish between where your essay 
um, ends and then your works cited page begins. Please make sure that when you um, start the works cited page, you either label it as works cited, references, or bibliography, and you center that those words, whichever one you choose, you center it at the top. Do not italicize it, don't put it in quotation marks, although you can bold it. Um, and then you should make sure that all citations are double spaced. It, your citations page should also be double spaced, so don't, don't skip spaces between entries. I want you to indent, as we've seen in past examples, indent the second and subsequent lines of your citations. The first line, however, should begin um, all the way at the margins. And then if you want to indent, just hit the tab key. Um, and finally, I want you to list the page numbers of where you get you got your information efficiently. So it may be that you did not um, read a book or did not have a book to list page numbers and if you didn't have page numbers that's fine but if you do have page numbers remember to like make sure that you say page 225 through 250 and the through sign is indicated through the um the dash symbol all right so really that concludes the end of this works cited lecture um one of the things that i really wanted to point out though is that i found this website and it's from a college-based website so we know that it's a legitimate source and on the website you can actually it teaches you how to do both the work cited as well as the in-text citation i was so excited to to find this so it's from columbia college in vancouver canada and you can go here under how do i cite and look up whatever you're looking for so let's say you're looking um looking at how to cite a book so if you're looking to ha for how to cite a book it tells you the works cited example or it tells you how it should look the works cited example and then the in-text cit citation so if you're quoting from a book you are going to have a page number but a lot of you all use websites so let's look at a website websites don't have page numbers so it just tells you to use the author's last name if you have that or if there's no author's last name just use the title of the section or the title of the page or the title of the article right so it gives you all of this information but again um all of these things can easily change and it can become clunky regardless the four main things that I want you to remember to include is the author, the title of the article, and or the title of the publication, the date of the publication, and where you obtain the quote or data from. So I hope that this lecture has been helpful in helping you to learn more about citations. Um, if you have any questions, please email me so that I can revise some of the descriptions and answer your questions for the whole class. All right.